by being ordinary, by just being kind, by being uh, friendly, what joy it can bring. So you're given that opportunity, I take it. And it's a selfish need. It's a very, very, you know, he's, he's got a, he, there's a reason why he's here. The rest of us have just been put here to um, uh, just doodle about. But he's, he's here for a reason. I don't think many people are in this world for a reason. It was totally and utterly fascinating. And it was a world that I'd never met before. Part of London I'd never been to, people, sort of people I'd never met, sort of houses I'd never seen. It was totally, utterly fascinating. And I fell in love with it, with that, that whole setup. Just amazing as a child to see everybody's face lit up as soon as Daddy appeared. He's an extraordinarily good man. One of the very, very, very few good men. There are very, very few good men. His life is, will always be helping people and how much he enjoys it. When I left school, I didn't quite know what to do. I thought I'd go to the university. I got my entrance to Oxford, to Oriel. Slightly thinking, I suppose, towards the diplomatic, uh, civil servant sort of uh, roaming the empire sort of thing. Uh, but not at all clear what I wanted to do. But of course, the decision was taken out of my hands. I'm always declared. And uh, so I joined the army. I joined the Coast Stream because my family had a, a connection through uh, Four Bears uh, with the regiment, and so I didn't think of anything else. Very shortly after, I, I went through the usual steps to get a commission, and then became a, an officer in the Coast Stream. Then the War Office said, we've got too many foot soldiers. We're going to come back in a month's time, tell you whether we're going to put you into parachutes or tanks. And they came back a month later and said that we were, we guardsmen were too tall and heavy for parachutes. So we were put into a tank. And so I fought the war in what were called heavy tanks, Churchill tanks. But then in Normandy, Normandy landing, I was wounded came back to England to a hospital, uh, returned in time for the Rhine crossing, and then into Germany. Through Germany, through Belsen, I was one of the first ones into, into Belsen. And then when the war finished, we were still, of course, fighting the Japanese. So they took away our tanks, and said, right, go out to Japan and fight them. Put us on a boat in Liverpool. Then we dropped the bomb to Russia. We weren't then needed in Japan. Instead of the boat going to Japan, it went to Palestine. And I spent three years there. And the job finished in Malta. And I could have a month's leave and report back to Wellington Barracks. So I thought I would travel back from Malta through Europe as a, as a tramp and st stopping and sleeping rough and so on. So I bought a train ticket from the bottom of Italy up to Victoria in London and one of the places I stopped in was Turin. Thought I'd go and see the Shroud and there were very rich people and very poor people walking side by side very happily. So I said to somebody why am I seeing this harmony here in the street. And they said, oh, because of Cotolengo. Cotolengo turned out to be a place that a priest had started a few hundred years before when he'd found Italy very disturbed and ruined, and in ruins, a lot of villages and small towns. And he'd brought the refugees from those places into Cotolengo to live in comfortable surroundings with comfortable people. And that made me wonder what we were doing in England. So I suppose it started my social conscience. And so it became a turning point. In looking back, it must have been a, a turning point in my life. I uh, returned to England, and then I was stationed in Chelsea Barracks. 
And so I used to go into the chapel there and try and work out what my future should be, whether I should stay on as a soldier, lead the regiment, go on the staff and do other jobs. And so I went and prayed a lot and tried to work out what to do. And I think this experience in Cotalinka and the thinking that grew out of it would certainly help me direct my thoughts and actions. I'd done 15 years. I knew it was time to really think about whether to be a full 22 or not and wondered what to do. These three big S's came into my life of self, security and service. And whereas most people arrange, and I was arranging self and security first, and then thinking about service to other people. So I thought I'd try it the other way around. I went round various people, uh, sort of holy people and unholy people, to say, what about this? Have I got it upside down or, or not? And certainly Billy Graham was one of these. He'd just come over to do a uh, talk at Harringay. So I had it in my papers. I went and told my parents, my mother burst into tears. My father just sort of said, OK. I'd gone down to Bermondsey to try and see how people lived. I had no idea how people lived. And I would knock on doors, and people were very kind, and they would take me into their houses. And always I was shown, it's usually the front room on the right. And I never saw the rest of the house. Uh, and so I didn't really then know how they lived. I thought the only way to see into the inside of people's houses really how they lived was to uh, be a home help, to scrub floors, to go and clean. Then I saw the state of people's homes and I hoped that, that would help me make my mind up what to do. Bermondsey then <coughs> was about 150,000 people. It's now, I think, about 80,000. It was overcrowded, largely called slum, tenement houses built for workers to build the railways and the bridges over in London. I realised that, in fact, if anybody can clean a house, it's not a problem in scrubbing floors. Anyone can do that. But that what people were suffering from was loneliness, because when I had done my hour or two hours, I left them. And then they saw nobody until I came back next day or next week or next month. And in that gap, they were on their own. They just sat, the ones who were homebound and bedbound, roombound, uh, because there weren't district nurses, there weren't carers, there weren't all that many friendly neighbours. It's a, it's a, I was worried about loneliness. Well, the army had given me £1,150 instead of a pension because I came out early. So I bought a house for £450, and it was an ordinary little house, six rooms, no bathroom, um, lavatory in the garden. When I started the house, I just had two, an old man and an old woman. The old man was going blind, was blind within months, and an old woman kept the front door open and said to the neighbours, um, this is the point of this house, it, it's for people who are lonely living on their own. A push on the door I wrote so that they knew it was open, there was no formal ringing of bells and knocking on doors. And the, I said, bring your own cup, because I, have, of course, hadn't got cups, but I'd provide the tea. I had a teapot. When I got this job as a home help free, it had to be agreed by the council, in a public meeting, the press were there, and they picked up on this. And so it was then put in the papers. So the people learnt about it, but then also my friends, because I just left the army, so my ex-soldier friends came down to see what it was about. Certainly one of the first girls was Susan Gibbs, as she was then was, and another woman was Jenny Praviti, and various other friends all came down to help me, because I had to get this first house. 
And, and it all happened fairly quickly in that uh, the other two rooms filled up. Uh, and then a fifth person came and said, can I come and live with you? And of course there was no space, so I had to get another house. So I bought another house round the corner for £750, which was used up all my money. After the first two houses, my money had run out, um, the obvious thing was to rent and pay as we go, as it were, uh, because I had worked it out with the statutory authorities that I would need so much money each week to run the house, to feed and look after the people. Yes, that's right. Eamon Andrews got hold of it and put me on This Is Your Life. And that uh, the television programme. And that sort of widened the interest so that more people knew and people started giving me money. By the end of that year, 56, it was necessary to register legally as a charity. I wondered what on earth to call it and couldn't think of a suitable name except till we realised we were sitting in Abbeyfield Road and so we called it Abbeyfield Society. Then people started writing in and saying, come and start one with me, with us, in wherever we were in England. So various towns and cities started doing this when it had got to about 150, I think, it became a rather big organisation. This is after, say, nine or ten years. And I had realised, of course, that we'd drifted a bit because the houses were filling up with old people. And uh, so when they were, these central people were trying to organise it, they said that old people only will come here. And I said, well, please no. What about the younger ones, under 65s, who are lonely, for whatever reason? And they said, no, we've got our hands full with the elderly, therefore we're going to stick to that. And so various disagreements began to rise. And eventually it was thought best that I should be sacked and uh, to go away. Uh, I was dismissed, yes. It must have been unbelievably traumatic at the time. He was voted off his own board, as I understand it, by a majority of one, so it was a very close decision. Whatever pain there was at the time and in the ensuing years, I guess that demonstrates that you know, time is a healer and also, I think, uh, demonstrates that Richard, as an individual, was well able to rise above. Yes. I really don't know how many there are. I mean, I think it's about 1,500, 1,500 houses. Um, a lot of them, I say, uh, yes, quite a lot abroad, which is lovely. I, I'm particularly happy about the abroad bit, because uh, it shows that this is a human problem with a global answer. It's not just an English problem with an English answer, the fact that it's working in Japan or Germany or Cyprus or wherever it is, uh, America, Canada, Australia, you know, where, wherever it is, uh, it's a human issue, this one of loneliness. Hmm. And if you were celebrating that, uh, 40th anniversary, and um, they invited me, some of them, to come and join them in their celebrations, particularly Neil Burdett from Cambridge, I think he was chairman at the time. Uh, and that was wonderful, and so I've been very much involved with Abbeyfield, and I, I, I love them, and it, it's been a very, a very happy Reunion. I do find it remarkable from Abbeyfield's point of view that Richard was allowed to remain in the wilderness for so many years. But at least 
you know, we can say that in his last few years, you know, he was reconciled with Abbeyfield, and it's wonderful that you know, he was able to be much more directly involved in the work of Abbeyfield going forward. If I was alone, I, of course I'd go straight to, to one of the societies, preferably one which has got to let me have a room big enough for my computer as well as my bed and the rest of it. I would say very happily, <laughs> very happily go to one of the societies and knock on their door. I think everything about Richard was truly inspirational. It's truly inspirational to look at what he did back at the start. It was truly inspirational to meet him and feel his passion firsthand. And it was truly inspirational to see him interacting with a management team that now have the responsibility of taking on his mantle and taking Abbeyfield forward into the future. Richard was a wonderful man. He achieved wonderful things. And the new team running Abbeyfield will do their best to deliver in his memory. Thank you.